Okay, good evening. My name is uh, Alain Philippe Durand, I'm the Dorens Dean of the College of Humanities, and it's my uh, honor and pleasure to uh, welcome all of you here in person and from all over the world uh, on live streaming to this uh, session of the Tucson Humanities Festival. Uh, we would like to start today by saying that we respectfully acknowledge the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recogni recognized tribes, with Tucson being home to the Odam and the Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign native nations and indigenous communities through education offerings, partnerships, and community service. We also want to emphasize that this land acknowledgement is a milestone in our ongoing dialogue with the Tono Odam, the Pasqua Yaqui, and the 20 other federally recognized tribes in the state. It is an indicator of our commitment to collaboration and to maintaining government to government relationships with the native nations and indigenous communities with whom uh, we share this region. Thanks for joining us again at the 12th uh, annual Tucson Humanities Festival, which started back then as a Humanities Week and through community outreach, engagement, and incredible speakers has grown into a month long series of thought-provoking presentations during October each year to celebrate National Arts and Humanities Months. This year, the theme for the festival is storytelling. Uh, I would like to thank our sponsors who helped make tonight's event and the festival possible, Bookman's Entertainment Exchange, uh, Dorrance Foundation, Humanities Seminars Program, and uh, the Arizona Council for Humanities. We are excited to offer tonight's presentation to a wide audience at home through live stream and captioning provided by the town of Oro Valley. For those watching live, if you have questions you would like to ask the panelists, please find the link on Humanities Festival homepage. For those of you attending in person tonight, please use the QR codes posted throughout the seating area to submit questions as in deference to COVID safety, we will not be passing the microphone during the Q&A. So you should see those signs uh, that are across the, the room uh, with the QR code where you can ask uh, your questions that will be asked after the, uh, the main presentations. Tonight, we have the pleasure of listening to four College of Humanities professors presenting In Search of Fright, Tales of Monsters, Ghosts, and the Undead. Uh, the faculty presenting in this panel tonight are frightfully uh, suited for the topic. Uh, uh, Joella Jacobs, who is the assistant professor of uh, German studies. Uh, Dr. Jacobs' research focuses on the intersection of 19th and 21st century German literature and film with plant studies, animal studies, environmental humanities, Jewish studies, the history of sexuality, and the history of science. Dr. Jacobs teaches a course on weak tales and strange encounters, German romanticism and beyond, as well as another course entitled From Animation to Zombies, The Ethics, Biopolitics, and Aesthetics of Defining Life. Well, next to uh, Dr. Jacobs, we have uh, Dr. Colin Lucy, who is Assistant Professor of Russian and Slavic Studies. Dr. Lucy is a specialist in 19th century Russian literature and visual culture, and she's the author of uh, the book Love for Sale, Representing Prostitution uh, in uh, Imperial Russia. Uh, Dr. Lucy teaches the course RSSS 315, Vampires and Werewolves, Slavic Folklore in Our Culture. Uh, we, we also have Dr. Lucy Swanson, uh, my colleagues in the Department of French and Italian. She's Assistant Professor of French Studies. Dr. Swenson's research examines how historical narratives and political discourse are reflected in recent Francophone literary and visual culture, particularly that of Haiti and the French uh, Antilles. She teaches a course on contemporary Francophone fiction and cinema that explores how recent writers and filmmakers represent buried histories, including that of the zombie, as we will hear about tonight. And we also have Dr. Eddie White, uh, who is Associate Professor of Practice in the Department of Public and Applied Humanities. Dr. White specializes in classroom assessment. He currently develops and teaches courses for the Department of Public and Applied Humanities. 
among other courses, he teach a course entitled Weird Stuff, How to Think About the Paranormal, the Supernatural, and Other Mysterious Things, uh, which is open to all University of Arizona students. And he is also currently teaching a humanities seminars course called The Paranormal, the Supernatural, and the Human Experience open to all community members uh, for our uh, program in uh, uh, humanities uh, seminars. Finally, we also have uh, with us our colleague uh, Susan uh, Thompson, uh, who is assistant professor of practice in the Department of Russian and Slavic Studies. And we need to thank her uh, for the music tonight because she was playing the beautiful music uh, earlier uh, before the start. Susan worked for many years in the Soviet Union and, and post-Soviet Russia as an embassy attaché, uh, disarmament contractor, and journalist. She earned an undergraduate degree in piano performance at the University of Cincinnati's College Conservatory of Music and is providing the live uh, music for us tonight, as I just said. So I would like again to thank all of you for coming. And without further ado, let's go on with our first speaker. Uh, please welcome uh, Eddie White to start tonight's talk. everybody. Uh, welcome and, and thanks for joining us this evening. Um, my name is Eddie White and, and uh, I teach a course um, um, about the paranormal and the supernatural. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that as, as part of uh, my section about tonight's talk about ghosts. Um, and it's one of, the, one of the paranormal phenomena we get into with, with the course I teach. Um, you're probably familiar with, with the famous quote from Miro Rukas, or the American poet, that the universe is made of stories, not of atoms. And um, I think actually both of them are probably true. But I'm, I'm going to start, um, I'm going to bookend my talk with, with uh, I'll start with a story and I'm going to end with a prayer and we'll see how it goes. My story uh, is about two, my ghost story is about uh, two famous historical figures and a famous house, of course. Soon after World War II, Winston Churchill was visiting the White House when he is said to have had an uncanny experience. Having had a long bath with a scotch and cigar, he reportedly walked into the adjoining bedroom, only to be met by the ghost of Abraham Lincoln. Unflappable, even while completely naked, Churchill apparently announced, Good evening, Mr. President. You seem to have me at a disadvantage. The spirit smiled and vanished. It's a story some of you, you you may have heard of, and you may have heard about the idea about the, the, the White House being um, being haunted also. The course I teach, um, it's called Weird Stuff, Paranormal, uh, How to Think About the Paranormal, the Supernatural, and the Mysterious. It's been a lot of fun to teach, it's in, and students have been enjoying it also. One of the first things I do, uh, every time I teach the course, I always do a paranormal profile survey. And so I get the students to to see, to just to check what, what their levels of belief is in different paranormal phenomena. phenomena. And you can see their, their choices here. I believe very much, somewhat, a little, I don't believe. Uh, I just finished one course and I'm currently teaching another one. And let me just show you some of the results just about ghosts. And so the question is, ghosts are, are, and haunted houses are real. And if you see in the bottom, the bottom corner here, the count is, is the number to pay attention to. 47 students completed my survey. And you can see belief in ghosts and haunted houses among my undergrad students is quite strong. Many of them believing very much or somewhat. This is 47 students. Um, this is another class of 55 students. Very similar. More than half of the students in the class believing very much in, in ghosts, which is... Um, I find very interesting. And it's kind of representative of um, just paranormal belief in, in the United States. And, and this is from the Chapman University survey. And you see the first, um, the first bar here, places can be haunted by spirits, 58%. So um, belief in ghosts is, is, is widespread. 
there are two types of ghosts. We're learning about it in the course I'm teaching. Uh, while ghost experiences are many and varied, they can be divided into two basic categories, hauntings and apparitions. So hauntings are characterized by ghosts that appear repeatedly at the same time and place and go through the same motions time and time again. Uh, apparitions, on the other hand, are ghosts that appear to interact with the people around them. And some appear only once in an attempt to impart some information or complete some business. And other times, um, others may appear many times. Anybody know this famous ghost from, from, from films and movies and stories? Who is it? Got a name? Jacob Marley, of course. Yes, from, from A Christmas Carol. And one of the articles we use in our course is called The Fringes Mainstream. But uh, the author says, the belief in haunted places is so ancient that its origins are lost in time. And he also notes that it's likely that ghost stories predate written language by thousands of years. Um, ghost hunting ha has become very popular in, in lots of different places, including, including the United States. One of the articles that we use in, in the course I teach is this one. It's called Give Us a, a Sign of Your Presence, Paranormal Investigation as Spiritual Practice. And the author, he spent three or four years um, basically joining ghost hunting groups around the country and interviewing people and just interviewing people who were into ghost hunting and, and, uh, and finding out why, why they did that and what interested them so much. So let me just tell you a little bit of information about what he discovered. He says, a lot of people are out there, out there are pursuing a fascinating but frustratingly elusive prey, ghosts. Currently, over 3,000 paranormal investigation teams exist in the United States and more exist worldwide. This is from 2015. There's probably more now. I know there, there, are, um, there are three or four at least here in Tucson. So um, ghost hunting organizations and groups have, have been uh, spreading quite a lot in recent years. Paranormal investigators use a, a wide variety of investigative methods in their attempts to find evidence of ghosts and therefore life after death. For some investigators, the practice helps validate existing religious beliefs, while for others, it prompts a, a spiritual transformation. And the author notes that contemporary paranormal investigators differ in their techniques, but are motivated by a shared desire to capture evidence of life after death. Heidi, a 34-year-old investigator who was raised very strict Lutheran, explained, and let me just give you one voice. Here's what Heidi says. Honestly, the reasons why I... The reason why I even thought about getting into this was for answers. You know, what does happen to you after you die? And why do some people seem to go to heaven and some people stay here? It would be nice to be able to prove something that you believe in without any doubt. You want to find that definitive thing that's going to go, look, here's the evidence. Here it is. So just a voice of, a, 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 a voice of one ghost hunter. Paranormal investigation is a spiritual practice in that the act of investigating creates within participants a sense of being connected to and aware of some transcendent, perhaps divine reality beyond our world. So it's one of the, some of the rationale why people get involved in, in ghost hunting. So I think for, for many people who are involved in paranormal investigations and ghost hunting, they're in search of spiritual experiences rather than being frightened or, or being afraid. Um, apparently, there's some ghost hunting. Uh, it's not ghost hunting, but there are ghosts that are here at the University of Arizona. Uh, here's a headline from maybe a couple of years ago. The ghost of Old Main. Construction workers working to renovate Old Main have come to know the story of Carlos, the Old Main ghost. So if you have some free time later, you can wander over and see if, see if Carlos is around. Maybe you can see him. Here's a picture of a ghost, the haunting of Maricopa Hall. Okay. Uh, I don't know if that's the actual picture of the ghost, but some of the, some of the residences, some of the buildings on campus seem to be, seem to be haunted. Uh, I had the experience of taking a bunch of my students, about 30 students. We went on a ghost hunting trip downtown uh, in November of 2019, and I got some funding for the university, so the students were quite happy to go for free. Um, the picture isn't very good, but here's me with a bunch of students. So we went and we, we visited a place downtown. We had some ghost hosts that were explaining to us what we could expect to see. Apparently, there were five ghosts in the building. And um, so some of my students were 
were they provided us with some equipment, um, some electronic equipment for looking for ghosts, but they also uh, uh, provided us with some dowsing rods, which are used for finding water or other things sometimes. But here's a student with um, some dowsing rods and another couple of pictures here. But nobody got any evidence or a picture of a ghost except me. Just before we left, I got a picture of a ghost. I'm going to show it to you. And here is my ghost picture, OK? That may, look, that may look like a cat. That is a ghost cat, completely transparent. A couple of perspectives on ghosts. Um, from this book called Science and Spirituality, consider. If you adopt a scientific naturalistic worldview, it means you require evidence before you accept any claims involving the natural world. There is no evidence whatsoever for the persistence of the mind after physical death. So according to the author Berger, for ghosts to exist, much of what science has learned about life, physiology, and physics would have to be spectac spectacularly wrong. So he concludes that there are no ghosts, period. A different perspective from James von Prague, who wrote about the ghosts among us, and James said, science is all well and good, but when you get first-hand information from a ghost, it doesn't get much better than that. <laughs> so I think James is right. I mean, if you can get that, it doesn't get much better than that. Um, my opinion about ghosts, and the students asked me about it, and I guess I've come to a, a flexible approach about my belief in ghosts. And my belief in ghosts kind of depends on the time of the day. During the daytime, I don't believe in ghosts, but at night, I'm a little bit more open-minded about that. Okay, I started with a story. I'm almost finished, and I'm going to finish with a prayer. From ghoulies and ghosties and long-legged beasties and things that go bump in the night, good Lord, deliver us. Thank you. And next is my colleague, Colleen Lucy. Professor Thompson. Thank you, Eddie. I feel spooky already. Okay. Uh, so I'm Colleen Lucy from Russian and Slavic Studies, and it's my great pleasure to speak a little bit tonight about vampires and the history of vampires and the relation to the Slavic world. So the vampire has captivated human imagination for centuries. And while vampirism and stories of vampires and other life-sucking revenants have existed around the world for thousands of years, Western beliefs and our beliefs about vampires are deeply connected to Slavic folklore. The word vampire, as we know it, is in fact adopted from South Slavic, upir, pit, meaning to drink, and actually entered the English language through connection with the Slavic lands. Now, this is all something that we talk about in the class Vampires and Werewolves, Slavic folklore in our culture. So our modern conception of the vampire is very well, it's very close to twilight, but very far removed in some respects from Slavic folklore. Our modern conception of the vampire dates probably to the 1700s when a vampiric epidemic sway, uh, swiftly moved through the South Slavic lands in present-day Serbia and attracted a lot of attention from Western Europeans. So officials from the Habsburg Empire traveled to the Balkans and encountered vampire hunters. Groups of locals who believed that the recently deceased um, rose nightly from their graves to feed on blood of relatives and friends. As they opened the graves, they found what they believed to be evidence of life. So hair had grown longer, nails had grown longer, the body seemed as if it was bloated, as if the vampire had recently fed. A stake to the heart, decapitating the head from the body, sprinkling the grave with holy water, and similar measures were believed to vanquish the vampire 
and send the deceased to eternal life. Tales of vampire hunting expeditions were fueled by the rich Slavic tradition of folklore. These stories of the undead inspired Bram Stoker as he composed his iconic novel, Dracula. Like a diligent scholar writer that Stoker was, he went straight to the library and he started to look for stories of the undead, which is when he came across the name of the medieval ruler, Vlad III, also known as Vlad Dracula. The surname Dracula, uh, with its etymological link to Dracul, meaning the devil, so intrigued Stoker that he titled his novel after the medieval ruler. Now the real life Vlad Dracula was a Christian crusader, a medieval leader of Wallachia, located in present day Transylvania. Now, as this woodblock print makes clear, he struck fears into the hearts of enemies and his citizens alike by capturing them while alive and impaling them, a most gruesome and cruel death. Now, while there are no historical records that Vlad Dracula drank blood per se, this kind of bloodthirsty behavior made him connected to the vampire in the popular imagination. It seems as if he's dining, feasting in the company of rotting flesh, and maybe dipping his blood, dipping his bread in the blood of recently executed victims. We have, I think, it seems a need to tell stories of the undead. And Dracula and the vampire myth have inspired countless films, paintings, TV shows, comics, even cartoons for kids. So vampirism remains deeply rooted with Slavic culture and has, I think to interesting effect, been resurrected and used for political and social commentary, both in relation to Russia and in response to Russian rulers. So satirical images poke, poke fun, pun intended here, um, at Putin, current president of Russia, by liking him to Vlad Dracula. Now, while images produced in the West underscore the historical affinity between Vlad Dracula and Vlad Putin, uh, Russians have also been able to capitalize and cash in on the affinity to their own purposes. So when Putin's former wife, Lyudmila Putina, claimed that her husband was a vampire, muy muj, vampir, the tabloid stars printed an expose delving further into this issue. It was the highest selling issue of the magazine to date. I'm gonna quickly change the next slide because this is being uh, televised. So as we can see from our own experience, definitions of vampirism show the wide range of possibilities that this monster offers to modern audiences, both Slavic and not. Of course, the vampires of popular culture of twilight with their sparkly skin and their vegetarian impulses are far removed from those of Slavic folklore, as you'll shortly see. These flesh-eating, blood-drinking creatures rise from their graves to haunt and feed on the living. They remind us of the powerful symbolic meaning of blood to be a source of life and also a source of death. The blood is the life, to quote Deuteronomy, and also to quote Dracula. The vampire drinks the blood of the living and is refreshed, is born anew. Tales of such creatures circulated in Slavic oral traditions for centuries and were first compiled in the 19th century by the ethnographer Alexander Afanasyev. So his stories, including the one that I'm gonna share with you now, um, really feature these various kinds of sorcerers, heretics, animated corpses, and other undead beings. In this tale, titled Buckets of Blood, we can recognize many of the traits of the modern vampire. I share with you, buckets of blood. A peasant was riding through a field past a cemetery. It had already become dark. A stranger dressed in a red shirt and a sporty sheepskin coat overtakes him. Stop, he says, take me up behind you. Fine, hop on. They enter the village and approach one house after the other. Although the gates are wide open, the stranger keeps saying, they're locked. You see, these gates were branded with the cross. He approaches the last house. The gate is locked with a padlock, weighing a full 18 pounds. There's no cross. 
and the gates open by themselves. They enter the cottage. Two men are sitting on a bench, an old man and a young boy. The stranger takes a bucket, puts it behind the boy, stabs him in the back, and immediately scarlet blood begins to trickle out of him. After completely filling the bucket with blood, he drinks it. He does the same to the old man, and he says to the peasant, dawn's upon us, let's go to my place. In a flash, they find themselves at the cemetery. The vampire is about to seize the peasant, but he is saved by the cock's crow, and the corpse disappears. The next day, they find both the young boy and the old man dead. They immediately seek out the grave and dig it up, and they find the vampire has recently fed. They take an aspen stake and impale him. The end. <laughs> Buckets of blood. Thanks so much. We next have Lucy Swanson. Thank you so much for this chance to share a scary zombie story with you this evening. It's Buckets of Blood is a hard act to follow, but <laughs> um, I will try. So tonight I'll be sharing a zombie story from Haiti by a Haitian poet, Clément Magloire Saint-Aude, who helped create the Griot movement, which promoted Haitian folklore. He was also inspired by French surrealism, as you'll get a sense of in the dreamlike quality of the story. And the story I'll be reading tonight is called Veillé, or Vigil, and was published in 1956, originally. And I'll be reading a translation by Michael Richardson. Before I s actually read this, I'd like to say a few words about the origins of the zombie in Haitian culture. The zombie, before it became a cannibal, the cannibal that we all know and love, it was born centuries ago in the, the folklore of the French Caribbean. And it likely has roots even further back in African spirit beliefs. Today in Haiti, the zombie is a revived corpse that is forced to work in places like sugarcane fields. So it's really an embodied memory of enslavement and it's a way of critiquing this legacy of this history as well. So now I'll read Clément Magloire saint ods story, Vigil. The dead girl was lying in a narrow bed. She was black and beautiful and seemed to be asleep, delivered, one might say, from the cares of living. It was night in an uncertain alley in Bel Air, in the mortuary chamber. The gathering seemed crushed under the strain of oppressive and mysterious sorrow. The neighbors had gathered on the porch and the dead girl's mother was chatting in a low voice with the corpse attendant. It was whispered that the deceased had not succumbed to sickness and it was confidentially said that she had expelled her last breath without suffering. They said it was not a natural death. Drinks were being served in the corridor. I left Teresa's room, the dead girl's name was Teresa, and went on the insistence of the mother to sit between her and the corpse attendant, who immediately asked me for a light for her cigar. I struck a match, and as I brought the flame closer to the attendant's face, noticed that she had the eyes of an owl or a witch, with sharp animal teeth and hands that were horribly calloused. Our eyes met sharp as lightning before I turned to the maid who served cinnamon tea. At midnight, an angry man ran from the adjoining alleyway. He was mixed with a belly like a pregnant woman's. This thug was lashing out with vehemence at a young girl in a transparent nightgown. She was very beautiful and light-skinned with a mottled complexion and the looks of an angel. She was insensible both to the flailings that lacerated her body 
and to the blood that stained her clothes around her shoulder. In the distance, a dog howled sinisterly at death. My friends Laurent and Gaston called me over to share a bottle of rum with them. I left the dead girl's mother and the corpse attendant to their gossip, offered my apologies, and joined the drinkers. I sat down in an armchair in the corridor adjoining the dead girl's room, and so I was face to face with the deceased. In her white dress, heightened around the bust with lace flounces, Teresa seemed to be awaiting First Communion. In her eternal stillness, there was nothing mournful. There was on her lips the outline of a smile with an imperceptible hint of mischievousness. Her hair, raven black, covered her forehead. But as I examined her face, I had only to stretch out my arm to be able to touch her body. Something caused me to shiver. The eyes were not completely closed. And from beneath the eyelids, the dead girl seemed to be looking at me. And to look at me, in fact, with such fixity that filled me with a sense of panic. I tried to move, but an intolerable cramp paralyzed my movements. I wanted to speak, but was voiceless. And Teresa still looked at me, at me alone. And my own eyes felt magnetized and were unable to detach themselves from those eyes from the other world. I was sweating ice cold and the dead girl looked at me and still her eyes, now half open, were like those of the living. And I saw her pupils, which were hallucinatory. Candles had been placed by the deceased's bedside. Suddenly, the flame of one of them flickered, revived as though in response to the breath of a hidden presence, and then was extinguished. The other glimmers of light, as though waiting for such a signal, followed suit. In the half-light that followed, Teresa opened her eyes wide. They were strangely beautiful eyes and had a sensual gaiety that was unseemly to the point of cruelty. With a great deal of effort, I managed to rise like an automaton in order to close the eyes of the dead girl. There was a terror that chilled my blood and a wisp of smoke escaped from my jacket. An indescribable serenity suddenly permeated my soul as I lifted my pipe to my lips. All the guests had left. For half an hour, the cathedral bells had rung. In the east, the stars paled. So here we have a tale of what seems like a girl who's in the process of being transformed into a zombie or a slave. But now I'd like to say a few words about how this, this kind of zombie transformed into the zombie that we all know and love, the cannibal. And this starts with the text, The Magic Island, a travelogue by William Seabrook, Seabrook that first introduced the zombie figure to US audiences during the US occupation of Haiti. It represents zombies as automatons that work in the sugarcane fields of the Haitian American Sugar Company. It was hugely popular and it inspired the first feature length zombie film, White Zombie, which is also interesting because it mixed this image of the zombie as someone enslaved to a sorcerer with ideas about hypnotism that were hugely popular at the time in Europe and the United States. And so that's probably where we start to see the, the outstretched arms, the vacant glaze, and the total lack of volition in the zombie. And after White Zombie, there were numerous other zombie films before the zombie became a cannibal. Um, and it's most likely, or it's most often in Night of the Living Dead, which was directed by George Romero, that the zombie is said to have become a cannibal. And that's despite the fact that the word zombie is never uttered in the film. So the people who are called ghouls and homicidal maniacs, but who do have a bloodthirsty lust for human flesh, as it says here, probably were recognized by audiences as zombies because of these same characteristics, the outstretched arms, the vacant stare. And so that's how the zombie migrated from Haiti, where it's a figure of enslavement, to the film industry of the United States, and now globally, of course, as a flesh-eating figure of viral terror and of divided nations at war with themselves. Thank you.
Thank you very much. <clears throat> that didn't sound very scary, did it? Right? So why did I choose that? Uh, now imagine a doll, a creepy doll or a marionette dancing to that tune. And all of a sudden, it gets really, really creepy. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about um, this piece that's coming out of an, an opera and what that has to do with the story I'll be telling you about today, the story of the Sandman. Who here knows the Sandman? Everybody knows ghosts, vampires. I see one hand very clearly up, another, OK. Can't see you that well, another hand. OK, so a few people know the Sandman, but most of you uh, seem to not know the Sandman. So very different from um, the vampires, zombies, ghosts. So I'll have to tell you the Sandman story first, right? OK, so as a young boy, Nathaniel was told about the Sandman as a good night story. The Sandman steals the eyes of children who do not go to sleep, and he feeds them to his own kids on the moon. Nathaniel is pretty traumatized by that bedtime story. And he associates the Sandman with a visitor who comes at night and conducts experiments with Nathaniel's father. They are alchemists. They're trying to make gold. Uh, one night, uh, Nathaniel doesn't stay in bed. He gets up to see what they are doing. And the visitor, who's named Coppola, threatens to throw glowing embers in his eyes and screw off his arms and legs. And at a later point, Nathaniel's father, father actually dies during one of these experiments. And so young Nathaniel associates all this with the Sandman. Coppola is the Sandman to him. And uh, especially if you think about you know, the sand in the eyes, the embers in the eyes. So young Nathaniel has this, this childhood trauma. And in the now of the story, he's grown up. He is studying at a university town. Uh, maybe a, a little bit like Tucson, maybe maybe a little bit different. This is a sort of, uh, you know, 19th century Germany. And um, he meets a seller of glasses and binoculars. Eyes, again. That uh, salesman is named Coppelius, very similar to Coppola. He is a doppelganger of his childhood uh, fear. And Nathaniel is convinced he's meeting the Sandman again. But his friend called Lothair and uh, his fiance called Clara, they try to calm him down with rational explanations. The two are uh, brother and sister, by the way. And uh, um, you know, so far, so good. But then a fire destroys Nathaniel's house. And he moves into a new place uh, right opposite from his university professor. Now you might say, OK, not as much drinking. Don't be as loud. But there are different problems afoot here. Uh, his professor has a daughter named Olympia, and Nathaniel becomes obsessed with Olympia. Uh, he looks at her through a set of binoculars, and that's a machine to trick the eyes, and he, he bought them from Coppelius, and he falls in love. So when the professor puts on a ball to introduce his daughter to society, he sees his chance, despite his engagement to Clara. I, just to remind you. And uh, he goes to this ball. He dances with Olympia um, all night, and he talks to her. Um, and weirdly enough, the other students do not seem interested in her. But Nathaniel is enchanted. Um, and one of the reasons is, is because she's such a good listener. She always just says, ooh, ah, when he tells her stories. Uh, she never talks back. So um, this. Uh, uh, you know, has him you know, convinced that this is the one for him, and he uh, tries to propose to Olympia. But when he goes to the professor's house, he sees the professor and Coppelius, the binocular salesman, fighting over her body. She is, in fact, a machine. She is an automaton, and Coppelius had made her eyes. Nathaniel goes mad. That is just upending his worldview. And Clara, good Clara, cares for him. So uh, at that point, the narrator adds in the story that people get really paranoid um, to, and wanted to make sure that their partners were actually real life people and not machines. So they started pinching uh, their partners to make sure they get, a, get an actual response. And um, as the story goes on, Nathaniel recovers. Uh, they visit his university town again. And they look down on it from a tower. And any one of you who's read German stories, might already have an inkling what happens now, because they kind of all end 
in the same way. So Nathaniel uses binoculars. He accidentally trains them on Clara. And he thinks she is a machine, too. She's an automaton as well. And because he thinks that, he tries to throw her off the tower. She is saved by her brother, Lothair. But Coppelius appears in the crowd. And he calls out, pretty, pretty eyes. And Nathaniel throws himself off the tower. That is how most German stories end. Everybody dies. But we actually have a quote unquote happy ending in this story because we hear that Clara gets to be married and have two children and live in a country house. You can decide if that's a happy ending or not uh, for her here. But um, that's the story of the Sandman. Now, the Sandman has, uh, so this, this version of it that I was telling you was written by um, E.T.A. Hoffmann, great name. Uh, uh, the full name is Ernst Theodor Amadeus, and he's a German author of romanticism. Now, Clara, just to point that out, she is uh, klar in German, clear. Uh, she's often translated as Claire, too. It's a, it's a, a, a symbol of enlightenment. And this author was a, uh, a really uh, talented guy. He also was a lawyer, also a composer, also a music critic, a draftsman, a caricaturist. So I, I want to see, like, his business card would have really probably been funny in this day and age. Um, and he was the first to really write about these dark elements of romanticism in the German context and was, is particularly famous for his fantastical pieces, the Fantasiestücke. And all of, except for the zombie, I think all of the figures we talked about tonight appear in his stories. Uh, uh, speaking animals, secret societies to add to the ghosts and the vampires, doppelganger figures, of course. And um, so one thing that sticks out about this particular story is the idea of, and I'm going to, let's see, automatonophobia. There we go. OK, it's the idea of autonomous, see, second time, it doesn't work anymore, the fear of humanoid machines. Um, especially if they seem sentient. And so that is where we started with, with the opera, with a doll, with an Olympia figure. That's why that's creepy. But it might be ventriloquism for you. It might be uh, automata. It might be AI that freak you out if they're just too close to looking and acting human. So you might say, in, why in the 19th century? This is a, this is a problem for today. But um, at that time, the Industrial Revolution uh, brought a lot of not uh, technological innovations. And when I say technological innovations, I do also mean things like glasses that change your view of the world, right? Um, so in addition to that Olympia figure, we have technology in the alchemy, the optical instruments, the doppelganger, doppelgangers. And so the question is, can we trust our eyes when technology interferes? Um, so. This is the Sandman as you would meet it today in Germany. Quite a different picture, still a children's goodnight story. So Little Sandman, Sandmännchen, is the most popular German children's story on German TV. It's run both in East and West Germany since 1959. And the East German Sand, Sandmännchen is what you see here, because that one won out, which is, which is not very common in East-West relations. <laughs> so, this Sand Mansion comes on every night, I think a, a little before six on German TV still, and it sprinkles sand into your eyes, but for good dreams. And there's always a story being told in the middle. So that is what Sandman is today. Um, but Sandman is also in a lot of other popular ideas, and I do want to flag this moment of the dream, the good dreams, because Freud was really into the Sandman story by Hoffman and was um, uh, using it in his text on the uncanny and um, also his concept of the doppelganger. So, where is the Sandman in the US? Well, you might know this song, The Cordettes. Mr. Sandman, bring me a dream, right? So that one, um, uh, here too, the Sandman brings you a dream and dream, brings you a dream guy, though. Um, and then there's another one, a little bit more recent. Different musical genre, Metallica, enter Sandman, exit light, enter night, take my hand, we're off to never, never land. So the Sandman is still around. Um, and maybe when you heard Sandman, you thought this graphic novel, maybe some of you know it. If not, I can only recommend it, uh, the Sandman series. Or perhaps you thought of the literal Sandman in Spider-Man 3, uh, also a Sandman. So the Sandman, I think, through the sand can really take on any kind of shape, it seems like. 
And uh, the last one I want to share with you uh, is, oh, oh yeah, there it is. Um, is this Oscar-nominated animation called The Sandman from 1992, a 10-minute clip on YouTube. I can only strongly recommend it. Um, it is spooky scary. Just search for Sandman, comma, the 1992, and you'll get this one. So to this day, Sandman scares us, and I hope you like this introduction to another frightening monster. And now, as a reminder uh, for, um, for those watching live, is what I'm supposed to say, if you have questions you would like to ask me or any of my uh, co-panelists, please find the link on the Humanities Festival homepage. For those of you attending in person, please use the QR codes throughout the seating area to submit questions. Um, as in deference to COVID safety, we will not be passing the microphone during the Q&A. Testing. Okay. Well, thank you much, uh, so much, uh, each of you, for, for interesting stories and sort of opening our, our minds to the different cultures and different monsters. Um, we have some questions. We'll start with sort of one uh, to everyone. Um, what do you think the emergence of these stories about various undead creatures that happen time and time again in cultures around the world says about human nature? Well, I would say the vampire, I mean, one of the, one of the found, founding myths of the vampire is that we have a longing for the dead. I mean, if you've lost someone, you're, you're deeply, you're in misery, and you want that person back, as, and you would give anything to have that person back. Um, and so there's this longing for the, for the departed, but there's also the fear of what happens when that, that wish is fulfilled, when somebody comes back from the other side. You've broken the, the laws of not just physics, but of, of religion, of what's good and what's bad. And when you do that, you're, you're selling something out and there's gonna be repercussions. So it's, it's also a way, I think, I think it's something about mourning and something about the need to return, a sense of return after all of deep loss, but also a realization that that, that loss will never be filled. I think that's one of the, you know, one of the myth, one of the standing foundational kind of ethos of that, of the myth of the vampire. And I think that's actually true about the Sandman, too, because the whole thing about sleep is that in, in sleep, we are as close to death as we can be, right? We're in this death-like state. So what happens? What kind of dreams do we have? Where do they come from? What happens when we're not fully awake and in control of our thoughts, as we think we are, right? Freud would disagree with that. But, but that's why it was also so fascinating with the story, right? What happens in our psyche? What are, what are these, um, you know, what, how do we think about ourselves vis-a-vis uh, -vis a creature like that? Is my this is oh yes yeah I think in the in the case of the zombie in Haiti it also translates a very real horror and as a way of reflecting on that critiquing it remembering it 
um, at all at the same time. Uh, just a, a thought about ghosts, as I was saying earlier. I mean, the the, the idea of ghosts has, has has been around probably longer than than written history, and I think there's a I suppose there's a strong connection to to the idea and the hope. I suppose also of of, of life after death and and um, people wishing and hoping that that connection is there. We have another story. Um, so we heard about both zombies and vampires as separate entities. Um, if we refer to different cultures, including Western culture, were any of today's modern zombies or older zombie tales inspired by ancient vampire stories? And maybe to extend the question a little bit more, how much do different stories merging across cultures sort of influence other uh, monsters? Yeah, so the, the zombie has been connected back to beliefs about soul theft and forced labor and also forced migration from West and Central Africa. And they're not usually linked with the kind of soul sucking. There, there is a theft of the soul, but it's not usually consumed by someone in quite the same way as the vampire. Um, but it's certainly, I'm sure there are some other, some connection, sort of subterranean connections somewhere. Yeah, I would, I would also say, you know, the, the vampire of, of Slavic lore it looks a lot like a zombie, as we understand zombies in, in, in the West, you know, eating of flesh, uh, breaking this, you know, this taboo. And so I would say there is fluidity. I mean, the monsters, I mean, they're, they're breaking, they, I mean, they violate taboos. And so there is similarities in terms of what the violation will be based on the cultural context. But it's interesting how, like, in the current moment, ghosts, vampires, zombies, and the Sandman, as you pointed out, like can be commodified and also can be, you know, ripped of their like monster power, and in order to sell, you know, I don't know, Mattel dolls or whatever it might yeah, be. Yeah, and I think there's another connection also in the physical science when you were describing how they're opening the graves, right, and looking at the hair, the nails, um, and so forth. I mean, with the Sandman, why is it sand? It's because we wake up with sand in our eyes, right? I mean, little little <laughs> crust and crumb there, and so so there are there are also ways, of course, of explaining things about uh, ourselves and and that that might happen in the moments when we're no longer conscious or when we don't have control over our own bodies, right? I think mm -hmm. that yes. might be yes, yes. Um, something that that connects maybe all four. Yeah. Oh, and I, there were also some zombies that, um, in, in Night of the Living Dead, for example, they use the term ghoul that does refer back to beliefs that are sort of akin to vampires in the, the Middle East. So there are some, some connections there, certainly. Uh, Professor White, you'd mentioned a spiritual component to ghost hunting, and Professor Lucy's story referenced the crosses on houses. Uh, to what degree might established religious traditions impact the evolution of the supernatural folklore? Uh, it, it seems like uh, at least some of the some of the things that we 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 learn and study about in our class is that uh, with with if we can call it to the decline to some degree of of organized religion, it seems to be. Uh, an increase in, in, in beliefs in, in paranormal and, and supernatural things, including ghosts, and, and uh, that might be uh, part of the reason why the, this, the big increase in, in uh, ghost hunting organizations and, and paranormal investigating. So, um, But it, it's it, the intersections between religion and, and the supernatural and the paranormal, there is, there is plenty of them there, whether it's ghosts or angels or other parts of it. So it's it's uh, it's it's an interesting territory with no easy answers i would say it's, it's a good question because it either it's deeply rooted in religious beliefs i mean the the belief of the vampire i mean if you think about in the christian tradition and catholicism it is you're drinking the blood of christ and so if you go back to deuteronomy the first part of that quote is not i mean it's like don't drink of the blood because the blood is the life so it, i mean it, the vampire is an expression, and of course, it is imbued with a kind of Christian element that then is taken up by Anne Rice, an interview with a vampire who is like a uh, culturally Catholic, and so you see some of the the, the emphasis there in, in in that kind of body of work. 
So I think that the religiosity of the vampire tales is very interesting in the Slavic context because you have like the pagan folkloric beliefs at the beginning that are then kind of Im imbued with a Christian element. So the, the fact that the, the vampire can't enter a, a house that has a, a crucifix on it enters that this is a, an ungodly being that shouldn't be in a, in a place where, where godly people live. So you wonder, you know, what is the deal with that house that wasn't that didn't have a crucifix hanging up? You know, were they at, were they asking for trouble? They might have been. You know, and at least in the in the context of this. So let's go back to the fusion of like religious belief and and folkloric uh, traditions. Another question: Has the romanticization of ghost vampires, etc., such as modern vampire romance novels and sexualized spooky costumes? Has this existed throughout all of history, or is that a more modern development? And why do you think that's developed now? Why am I getting the mic? <laughs> <laughs> well, but I mean, for the vampire, I'm thinking immediately of Nosferatu, and then the like. This is like there is an older tradition, right? Of especially in film, of being incredibly attracted to the vampire. I'm not sure about the zombie, the Sandman. I don't know. I don't know. I think it's you know either the cute gnome or, or really creepy. So I think you should you should go for it. <laughs> there, so I would just plug vampires and werewolves when we talk about this because this goes back to the kind of an uncomfortable moment, um, which is a, about the decomposition of the body. Which what happens? What happens when the body decomposes? Okay, my 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 degree is in Russian and Slavic studies. I don't know anything about decomposition, but in preparing for this class, I learned quite a bit. And it's an ugly process. It is a really ugly process. The body bloats, okay? And during the decaying process, things become erect that aren't supposed to be erect after death, we think. So I'll let you kind of, you know, connect the dots there. As when these vampire hunters in the 1700s, like, open the graves, and lo and behold, not only... Does it see, like, feel like that the hair has grown, that the nails have grown, that there's teeth exposed, and that the body's been, like, recently feeding? There are signs of, you know, things you wouldn't be able to share with your loved ones that you, you've just witnessed, okay? So I, the vampire, just to say, in a lot of innuendo, that there's a reason why the vampire attracts us, and it's not just about life after death. It's the possibility of merging, you know, the sexualized being. That, that happens out, that can happen after death. It's one, one response. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, and we also see there are um, a lot of women in Haitian zombie stories who are sex slaves. So the story uh, that I read tonight suggests that. So there can still be, um, but, but usually they're ultimately sort of unsatisfying sex slaves. So yeah, have to have, have to have the cognizance uh, there. But um, there was sort of that, that dark element of uh, the representation of women in zombie stories. Uh, this is a, a sort of a related question. It, it starts out asking about, um, if you've seen the show, what do we do in the shadows? Um, but more broadly than, than just the vampire myths, um, what have TV representations uniquely contributed to the evolution of these various characters? Yeah. Um, I think with um, yeah with the zombie it's it's so interesting because with uh, shows like The Walking Dead it often seems like it's so much more about the the living humans than it is about about the zombie um, so yeah it's difficult to to see a um, to see a real evolution in in the zombie itself through um, through those TV shows but. Um, but thinking of what we do in the shadows really makes me think of Shaun of the Dead and sort of silly, uh, ridiculous zombies and ridiculous vampires, whereas normally there's such a figure of, of um, body horror and, and terror. In, uh, I also teach a course about the paranormal within the Huma Humanities Seminars Project. And uh, it's with an older group of students. And, and we do the same paranormal profile survey um, and asking them about ghosts. And their belief in ghosts is distinctly uh, lower than, than my undergrad students. And uh, I think part of the reason for that may be just the, 
proliferation of of shows about ghosts and ghost hunting, and there's a lot of them, and and uh, a lot of a lot of my students have seen them, of course, and I think that's that type of media, maybe social media too, has has influenced a strong belief, I think, in in ghosts. This is a good uh, follow-up to that one um, for Dr. White. Why do you think that people believe so much in ghosts, even if they have never seen one themselves or had an encounter? The, the, the biggest reason, I think, for, for belief in the paranormal and the supernatural is, is, is personal experience. And I'm sure there are people in this audience, either you, maybe they've had a personal experience with, with, with some ghost phenomena, or you've heard the stories or, or know somebody about it. So, so personal experience is... is um, is, is a key driver for a lot of um, beliefs in the paranormal and stuff, including ghosts. And I guess, meanwhile, the, the, the scientific community is, is, is waiting for more substantial evidence, shall we say, than, than anecdotal evidence. Did I answer your question? Yeah, um, anyone else on the panel to address sort of the, the idea of belief in, in the spread of, of some of these stories? More, more stuck in, the, in, in fiction with them. Um, there's a question about, and, uh, would any of you be able to compare and contrast these Western stories with tales of horror from non-Western cultures? Um, it's just uh, the, the, the general belief in the paranormal, the supernatural, in, in, including, um, including ghosts. I mean, the United States isn't any, any, any different from many countries, including Canada, where I'm from, or, or lots of places. I mean, around the world, the majority of people uh, in the planet have some kind of supernatural or paranormal belief, and it is it is commonplace now. And and uh, I spent a long time. I spent 15 years living in Japan, and Japan definitely has a has an element of, of belief in ghosts and, and and the supernatural. So these things are these things are are worldwide, and and the fringes is, is is now mainstream. And I find it. The very interesting thing for me, and I, I teach a course about the paranormal and the supernatural, I'm less interested in the paranormal and the supernatural than I am in people and believers and how people, how people develop belief systems and how they maintain, how it, how they maintain them and how, to, how it affects their lives. I would just say, you know, it's very interesting to compare vampire stories. There, I mean, in East Asian cultures, the vampire, the vampire and the and the zombie are kind of linked almost in one. I mean, there's a hopping vampire that is route that is um, that eats its own um, funeral shrouds, and so I would say, you know, it just goes to the timeliness of this, or like the timelessness, I should say, of of wanting to live forever, but also, you know, the bargain that you make when you do that. And then I would also mention, you know, Roma culture and Roma um, oral traditions that have been collected. Very interesting in terms of the vampire belief, um, and quite quite telling. A, a lot of them are are about, um, at least the ones the ones that come to mind, have a lot to do with like the loss of of mothers who have recently have lost their 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 children. And so, you know, I would say that. In some the Slavic world, that's not that's not really not present, but the Roma tradition has that. Uh, we've heard a lot about uh, fears and desires uh, from all of you. How does sort of the the, the positive and the negative between those play into sort of the evolution of some of these stories and characters? In the case of the salmon, we see that you know um, it's it's a figure of fear to to begin with, or a figure of, of trauma almost, and then it turns into this lovely bedtime story, right, where you get the sand sprinkled like glitter, and uh, it, it lulls you to sleep, and you get um, no longer nightmares but, but happy dreams. And I think um, we see similar transformations with stories of that time. We see that with fairy tales, for instance, right? If you look at the group of fairy tales, uh, same time period as that Sandman story. Um, and then you uh, look at the um, uh, versions we have today, right? There's there's a big big difference, and if you if you're not sure about the difference, I, I can pitch my class, Wicked Tales and Strange Encounters, <laughs> and you'll you'll read some original grim fairy tales, and they're pretty bloody and pretty pretty gruesome, and I certainly don't seem like they're uh, stories meant for children. 
So I think there's a that too, like which audience uh, does someone have in mind with a with a monster like this, right? Is it adult? Is it younger? Is it um, you know a specific group of people and so forth? Um, yeah, in in the context of um, the zombie specifically in Haiti, recently it's become a figure where um, it is used to represent sort of political awakening because the zombie in Haiti, if it eats salt, it awakens and then overthrows its master. So it has this huge resonance both within the, within the context of colonization and enslavement, but also thinking about the context of dictatorship and a sort of like collective um, overthrowing of, of a status quo. Um, and that's something that you you see some in the sort of cannibal zombie movies as well, like Land of the Dead, where George Romero sees the zombie um, as a symbol of um, people tortured under uh, George Bush's presidency and things like that, where it's really the sort of um, underclass of society that's able to rise up and, and overthrow the oppressor. Thank you. <laughs> It's interesting how there's also class that comes into. I mean, like you're pointing out these amazing things about about the the Haitian um, zombie to like talk about race and the legacies of, of of slavery. And I think you know the vampire can also be it's used as like a hybrid form. So if you think of Blade, the Blade series is like a human hybrid form to to think about um, the the duality, the double the double vision of the African American experience. So I I feel like that there's there's the question about fear and anxieties is also like leads you to think about the possibilities to express social critique, which is what a lot of these, you know, the, the monsters do. And maybe to add real quick, the, if we think of the machine, right, the, the woman, the automaton in, in that story, and not the same and figure of health, right? There too, we have, of course, tons of expectations about gender. Here's a woman who never speaks back, who uh, right, who is the perfect partner, who is a machine, who will never uh, have any of her own desires and, and needs. And uh, so that, of course, is also, uh, uh, you know, on a similar vein, that, that kind of uh, social criticism, and of course, in a pretty humorous way in the context of the story. But if you think about the fiance who sticks with him, also, maybe not so much. Uh, so we have a few questions about Hollywood and pop culture, and I'm going to try to merge them into one and, and follow up on, on what you've been saying with the last one. Um, so so you, you all studied sort of the, the, the emergence, the, the roots of these uh, stories and these characters. Um, so why do you think the Sandman is not very popular with people nowadays? That's one part to address. Um, what do you think would bring back the legend of the Sandman? And at the same time, why have zombie and vampire stories grown so popular? Uh, you know, all, take it all together, you know, if you were to study American culture now, what all the existence and popularity of these things reveal about us? Sorry, that was a lot. Yeah, it's a big question. I mean, part of it, I think, is is just, I mean, the Sandman, every child in Germany knows the Sandman. Every adult knows the Sandman. So in some ways, this is a cultural a cultural difference. But so this is a figure that hasn't been uh, colonized and imported, in a sense, right? Um, so if we think about where uh, our zombies and our vampires come from, a lot of them come from histories of, of violence and imperialism. And so, it, you know, and, and I think... If we're looking at entertainment culture, a lot of that is is, is entangled with that, of course, and um, especially when I think of the vampire in the in the German-speaking context, it's a it, you know there's a lot of anti-Semitism around that figure coming from the East, um, uh, and drinking blood and um, so forth. And so I think you know when we it, it depends on what you know how you can spin a story to to lend it to certain audiences. And so for instance, some of the grim fairy tales, there it worked really really well, right? And the Sandman, this, this idea of feeding the eyes of children to, to Sandman children on the moon, um, I guess didn't take off, but <laughs> it's a shame. You tell me. <laughs> um, so I think um, the, the vampire, and I would imagine maybe you feel the same way about the zombie, is like very flexible in terms of it's like elastic. It can like express a lot of different things and can be a lot of different things to a lot of people. And it could be used in like different modes um, of media, and so I think that that's part of the reasons why you know the legacy of why it can just kind of continually be reborn, or like the eternal life of the vampire. I think also that 
you know, who doesn't want to live forever and who doesn't want to look young and beautiful and, and, and be sexy. I mean, that sounds like a great dream to me. And if, if the, the trade-off is that you drink blood, I mean, like, what is that really so bad? I mean, this is the, the I mean, the vampire myth is, I'm joking, but it has an, a kind of appeal to it. I mean, you can't, um, I'm not advocating that of course, but I, I, I'm saying that, that there is something about this myth that it is it can express social critique and can talk about the mourning of one's lost uh, of, a, of a lost loved one, and it's also about wanting to live forever. And that's a I mean that is what Hollywood is. I mean so I think that it appeals to young audiences. It appeals to ages, to all ages. Yeah, and in the case of the zombie, there's definitely that that plasticity and elasticity to the zombie figure, um, and it was. You know, in, in Night of the Living Dead, when it first became a cannibal figure, it was within this context of the civil rights movement and um, protests over the war in Vietnam. And this moment when it seemed like the social fabric of U.S. society was, was you know, frayed and there was really a sense of a society at war with itself. And then there was a sort of zombie renaissance soon after 9-11 when it felt like there's another sense of a sort of apocalyptic moment um, in, in the United States. So I think it, it translates those moments of uh, social stress and tension um, very, very effectively. Well, thanks for everybody. Uh, I think we'll do one more. And again, I'll, I'll kind of combine uh, two together because I think there might be uh, a relationship between the two. Um, so, and it's for, for all of you, but first as scholars, what led you to these supernatural creatures as subjects to research and teach? And also, is there a story that you grew up with that scared you? Um, I started teaching this course about the paranormal and the supernatural um, a couple of years ago, and I'm, I'm no expert in the supernatural, the paranormal, but what I wanted to do was teach a, a course about critical thinking. And, um, actually approached our department head and said, I'd like to teach a course about critical thinking. And he said, Eddie, you can't teach a course about critical thinking. I said, why not? He said, because it's the College of Humanities and everybody is doing critical thinking or it's, it's a general part of the plan. He said, but he said, if you can come at it from a different angle. And I did some investigating and looking and, and, and just stumbled on the fact that the paranormal and the supernatural is the perfect kind of uh, arena for, for practicing critical thinking. Because what happens is you get individuals, you get students who will say, no, that's bullshit, but I believe that. And then say, okay, so let's take a closer look about what's, what's going on there. So that's how, I, that's how I ended up developing the course. Uh, a scary story, the one that comes to mind, Salem's Lot scared the hell out of me when I was 15, so. Well, I grew up with the Sandman, so <laughs> a big surprise there, and with, with the original German fairy tales, and when I think back to some of my, my German children's books, I, I, I'm, you know, uh, in, the, in the U.S. American context, I'm, I, I don't think those would um, be printed or sold or published or anything like that, and, and so, um, it, it's, so they do make good material for, uh, um, you know, research into cultural conventions, into uh, uh, the psyche, into, uh, I think, also, you know, critical thinking. Uh, what do we, you know, what do we think about as something that's appropriate or not? Um, what kind of stories do we tell? What sticks with us for, for which reason? And so, in, in some ways, you know, uh, the, the Wicked Tales class that I teach uh, is, is really a 19th century literature class, but this is what 19th century literature is like. It's the same stuff that's on TV today. In, in a lot of ways, right? We can either, I don't know, plenty of shows uh, we, can, we can throw out that uh, sort of do similar things. And I like that kind of looking at that kind of continuity. And the other course, uh, From Animation to Zombies, I was looking for a word with Z, from A to Z, right? Because we're defining life in that course. But then I really get so stuck on these, on these creatures in between living and dead, right? And this question of how we define things and what that determines in our real life too, right? And in a uh, medical crisis as we are all in now, I think those questions of, of living and dead and how we define and what's in between and why we imagine creatures in between is um, has also like a, a really important relevance. 
So I want to also acknowledge that this class uh, was taught by Professor Thompson, who also did the amazing musical accompaniment this evening. So um, to, to, the, to the question about how this course kind of came, came to me. So she had taught it for many, many years. And other people teach in the department as well, in the Russian department. And um, I would say what is interesting to me in terms from, from a scholarly point of view is how right now, how the vampire myth can be used in current political crises from border countries of Russia to comment upon Vladimir Putin's like, presidency. And so I think, you know, to, to my mind, it's, it's a very poignant image of this like undead ruler who seems to, like never age, who disappeared for like maybe two weeks in like 20, 2005, we weren't sure what happened. And then in Ukrainian presses, it becomes a kind of a, a massive way to comment upon Russian, Russian imperialism in the current moment. So I think from a scholarly point of view, it's, it's an interesting avenue to pursue in the, in the graphic arts. And I also think that the vampire, you know, its appeal, its lasting appeal, and why it brings us to Slavic folklore is something that teaches us about the stories that we tell ourselves in order to understand the afterlife. So it does go back a little bit to the Sandman. And in terms of stories that that scared me, I, to date myself, I loved R.L. Stein. I loved scary stories. I loved anything that had an element of the paranormal to it. So it seems like you know, from an early age, I probably should have been taking your class. Um, and I would have been one of the, the, the 44, the 55 that, yes, I absolutely believe in the paranormal. I came to my interest in the, the zombie, um, well, I was a, a zombie film fan. I loved 28 Days Later and some of those zombie uh, Renaissance films. And then I took a couple of classes as a graduate student in Francophone Caribbean fiction and was struck by this new figure of the zombie that I hadn't encountered before. And that was so rich, had this rich historical and symbolic significance and um, a whole different way of being represented in, in Haitian and uh, French Antillean fiction. So that's how I became interested in that. Um, and I was also really into R.L. Stein and um, Stephen King, especially the It uh, miniseries as a child. So spooky clowns, a whole other <laughs> monster we haven't discovered, uh, yeah. discussed tonight. Yeah. Next humanity. <laughs> Next humanity. Well, thank, thank you all so much. Let's have another big hand for our panelists and for Professor Thompson on piano. And we'll wish all the students a happy Halloween.